for righteousness. Maybe one of the most basic things that we fear in our life, in our heart, is futility. We want to know that what we're doing or planning or thinking matters. And if you've ever been in a place where you felt like whatever you did, you could do good, you could do evil, and it didn't matter, none of it mattered, none of it got you forward at all, progressed anything. You know, we, we talk about two steps forward, one step back, how frustrating it is to, to live a life where it's one step forward, one step back, or maybe one step forward, two steps back. The more you try, the worse it gets. Um, they say quicksand is that way. If you get caught in quicksand, the more you struggle, the more it pulls you down. And sometimes life can feel that way, and we feel like we live in futility. And a despairing question is often, is sometimes asked, what's the point? What good is it doing? This reveals fearful and discouraged thoughts, like, are my efforts making a difference or am I wasting my time? Does anyone notice or care? Am I doing a good thing or is it the wrong thing? And when we're asking these kinds of questions, we're struggling with this idea of futility. I, you think about the, the, the army, an, an army on, in, in battle, in a war, an army's morale craters when the soldiers feel that they are risking their lives unnecessarily. This doesn't need to, to take anyone's life, but we're being asked to risk our life. This is unnecessary. Or if they are engaged in a lost cause or an evil cause, and you look in history and you, you see very evil administrations and very evil wars, and there are people that fight on the side of evil, and their reasons are not evil, but you see their morale as you start to learn some of these stories. I think about Nazi Germany and and the, the, the administration and power was very evil, but not every soldier that fought was doing it to follow that administration or for those evil purposes. And as the war went on, you, you find that these soldiers fighting, their morale went down because they realized how evil it was and, and in some cases how lost a cause it was. On the flip side, morale is very high when the soldiers feel that they are engaged in a morally right cause and they have a legitimate chance at victory. In those cases, many people, many soldiers are willing to sacrifice their lives for the cause. They're, they're willing to lay down their life because it's a good cause and they, they feel it's not futile. They do not fear futility. They know what the point is. What's the point? That's a question that reflects that somebody is dealing with this idea of futility and it's, it's, a, it's a heavy burden. In our text today, I think we see that Abraham, Abram, is fearing futility. He's grappling with this. What, what's the point? How am I getting ahead here? Where, how am I making progress? He's questioning things at a very deep level. And this has the effect of negating many of the victories that God has already given him. When you feel, if you, if you feel today that your life is futile, that will tend to make you forget and make, make you feel like the past victories have been erased. What's the good of them if my life from here on out is futile? What's the point? It can be that way with us. And this morning I want us to consider the fear of futility. The fear of futility and, and see how God ministered to Abram in his time of need. And we see God's ministration to Abram in these six verses. Let's pray and then we'll consider the text. Lord, I pray that you would help us to be on the right side, to be on your side, to be engaged in your service. And when we are, it is not futile. It's not in vain. It's not worthless. It's not a lost cause. It's not an evil cause. And people can be engaged in a futile cause. It's futile to fight God. It's futile to oppose God and to be uh, pursuing and supporting and promoting evil. That's a futile thing because in the end, God will be the victor over all evil and will defeat it once and for all. It's futile to oppose and resist God. But Lord, we don't have to live a futile life. We can be living a wonderful cause, uh, following a wonderful cause and, and be doing eternal things accomplishing eternal things with our life. 
our lives don't have to be futile, but they do need to be surrendered to you. And when they are, we don't have to fear futility. I pray that you'd speak to us from the life of Abram. Help us to learn some lessons that Abram learned and be encouraged in ways that he was encouraged. And we ask for your help now. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I want us to see Abram's complaint, first of all. We see his complaint in the, in the opening verses of this chapter. And the word complain means to utter expressions of grief, to lament. And when we complain, we complain about our aches and pains. I am lamenting over the physical pain that I'm in. I'm lamenting over, you know, I just lost my job, or uh, I, I just lost a friend, or a loved one passed away. I'm complaining about these things. And Abram is uttering expressions of grief, and he is lamenting. And he says this in verses 2 and 3, Lord God, what wilt thou give me, seeing I go childless? And the steward of my house is this Eliezer. Behold, thou to me thou hast given no seed, and one born in my house is mine heir. That he's, he's complaining about this. This is an expression of grief, but I first want us to note, he opens up his complaint with the proper words. He brought his complaint to God. So often you and I complain to each other. And we, we, we just, we're, we're, what we're doing is we're, we're, we're venting, we're, we're taking the burden of our heart and we're just putting it on somebody else. I'm so sad, I'm so, I'm so impatient with this issue, I'm just going to plop it on you because I want to complain, I want to give voice to these things. But Abram brought it to God. He says, Lord God, and then he complains. Maybe we shouldn't complain. I think it, at times it's okay to bring our lament and our grief to God. And we, maybe we know it's wrong. Sometimes we're just, we're just being in the flesh and we complain. And, and we shouldn't complain in those ways. But, but it's normal to have complaints. And it's good to bring them to the Lord. And that's what Abram did. He said, Lord God, what wilt thou give me? We don't have the tone of voice that Abram had. And, and we could try to put that in and, and we'd probably be wrong. But scripture doesn't record this tone of voice, but I think it's important to notice that his words and especially the fact that he started out with Lord God, this is lifting up God. He is, he is speaking to God as, as, as Jehovah. You are Jehovah, you are omnipotent. And I'm starting off my complaint by acknowledging that. That's a good example. When we speak to God with an attitude of pride and accusation, we don't lift up God as Abram did. He was struggling with these complaints. He was under this burden, and maybe he wasn't thinking of it all right, but he did lift up the Lord, and he did bring his complaint to God. He was struggling to rest in the Lord, but he did go to God for help, and we should as well. Turn over to Psalm 13, and we see this example. Psalm 13, and this is, this is just a, this is a, a common thing in the Psalms. You read in the Psalms and you read of many complaints that the writers had. And they're always bringing them to God. And we don't always do that. And so we should. Bring your complaint to God. I'm so thankful that he is willing to listen. And he will correct us when we're thinking wrong. Again, it's not, it's not wrong to be sad, to be in grief. But sometimes we can complain uh, for the wrong reasons or from wrong heart issues. But when we bring our complaint to God, we're going to the one who can actually help us instead of sometimes we can complain to other people because we're looking to be uh, soothed and, and, and uh, praised maybe in our, in our complaint. But God won't do that, but he will give us real answers. Psalm 13, we, hear, we see a complaint here. How long wilt thou forget me, O Lord? Forever? How long wilt thou hide thy face from me? This is a complaint. How long shall I take counsel in my soul, having sorrow in my heart daily? How long shall mine enemy be exalted over me? Lord, you're hiding me from me. You're hiding from me. You've forgotten me. The enemy is exalted over me, and he's complaining. He's feeling some things. He probably knows that God hasn't truly forgotten him. But he is complaining and he feels like God has forgotten him. But he's going to the right place with this complaint. He's going to the Lord. Verse 3, consider and hear me, O Lord my God. Lighten mine eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. Lest mine enemies say, I have prevailed against him. And those that trouble me rejoice when I am moved. But I have trusted in thy mercy. My heart shall rejoice 
in thy salvation. I will sing unto the Lord because he hath dealt bountifully with me. You know, when you take your complaints to other people, when you go to the world for consolation, you don't end up like this. Go to the Lord with your complaint, and he'll give you real help. And that's what Abram did. He went to the Lord, and as we'll see, he was helped. Psalm 142 says, I cried unto the Lord with my voice. With my voice unto the Lord did I make my supplication. I poured out my complaint before him. I showed before him my trouble. This is the right place to go. We have complaints, and maybe quite regularly, but we ought to take them to the Lord, and that's what Abram did. He maybe, maybe shouldn't have complained in some of these ways. Maybe he should have been more trusting, but he did take his complaint to the right place. And let's turn back to Genesis 15, and we'll see the next thing. He took his complaint to God, and let's see his view of the problem here. What was his complaint? This is what he saw. In verse 2, it says, Abram said, Lord God, what wilt thou give me, seeing I go childless? And the steward of my house is this Eliezer of Damascus. I am childless. This is my problem. I don't have a son or a daughter. And we know that this was true of him. And he says, my steward is Eliezer of Damascus. Damascus was in Syria. And, And Abram is saying, I don't have anyone to take on my, the, the, the uh, administration of my goods. You know, I have all these herds and tents and servants and all these things, but I don't have any descendants, I don't have any heirs, and if I die, who's going to take over all this? You know who it's going to be? It's going to be Eliezer, a Syrian. He doesn't, he, maybe he, he, he didn't follow the Lord with his whole heart, but Abram is complaining, this, this is not your plan, God. I don't have a son. You, you promised that I, would, that I would have a great future and all these things that you've promised me, but if I die now, a Syrian will be in charge of everything that I own. This is who is in charge. His view of the future. He says, you, we know in Genesis 12, too, that God promised to make of him a great nation and give the, the land of Canaan to his seed. God had already promised these things in Genesis 12 and Genesis 13. But Abram is saying, this hasn't happened. Verse 3, to me thou hast given no seed. And lo, one born in my house is mine heir. This is, this is what I have to look forward to. This is what I'm complaining about. Lord, what will you give me? I don't see these promises coming coming true yet. You haven't given me what I need. And this is how we complain to God. Look at me now. Look at at the situation I'm in right now, Lord. I'm complaining about this right now. And you know what will happen? This is what will happen in the future. It will be really bad. And we tell God all about the bad things that will happen down the road. You you haven't given me what I need. That's really at at the foundation of a complaint. I am missing something that I need because you haven't given it to me. What wilt thou give me? Instead of me having an heir, the children of my servants are my heirs. And that's what he says. One born in my house is mine heir. They're not even related to me. Their parents just work for me. But the, the child that's born to my servants is mine. That's the best I have. I don't have anyone else. And we could look at this in a couple of different ways. I think that we could, we could um, assume that Abram is very fleshly and very uh, angry, and I don't know that that, that is true to, to go to that extreme. We could say from a very fleshly point of view that Abram is saying, I am upset that I don't have a child. I cannot enjoy what I have because I don't have the greatest desire of my heart. And, and whether or not he was thinking or feeling this, this is human to think about this. I don't have what I want, and so because I don't have this, I can't enjoy anything else. Um, I'm trying to remember, I think it was Hannah who said to her husband, Give me a child or else I die. No, that was, uh, excuse me, that was Rachel, the wife of Jacob. She said to Jacob, give me a child or else I die. And Jacob was angry. Am I God? How can I do this? But Rachel had many blessings in her life, but she was fixated on a child and she couldn't enjoy anything else. And this is how we can be. This one thing that we don't have, the lacking of it, means that we can't enjoy the blessings that we have. And maybe that's what Abram was feeling. We don't know that for sure. A fleshly view of what he said would, would 
indicate that he was feeling mistreated or neglected by God. He was maybe discontentedly suggesting backup options to God to help him out. One born in my house is my heir. Is this really what you want? I mean, this appears to be what will happen. I'm getting pretty old here. Maybe he was just pointing out God's neglect to him. Maybe he was expressing doubts about the wisdom of God's plan. And we don't know any of these things for sure. And so we should be careful about assuming this. But, but this would be consistent with a very fleshly view of Abram's condition. And another way of looking at it, a focused view of what he said, he could have been concerned about this primarily because he wanted God to keep his promises. Lord, you've promised this to me and I don't see it happening and I don't want you to break your word. I'm concerned that you be glorified and so I'm expressing a desire for that to happen. I want you to, to receive glory in all of this. God, you promised me a child and it hasn't happened yet and I'm anxious to see you do a miracle. Maybe he, would, he was communicating... You know, it's nice that I have all this wealth, but that's not, that's not really where my heart is. I want to see you give me a child and, and fulfill the future. I, it's nice to have luxury and, and all these things that I have, but this is not where my heart is. I'm not, I'm not caught up with material things. I want what God has promised to me. I'm not content with my solutions. I can develop a herd. I can, I can treat my servants well, but I, I want what God can do. I'm distressed to think of where I might end up if God should not act in the way that he's promised. And, and I'm, I'm inclined to think that there was kind of a mixture of these things that Abram was feeling, because you and I can be there. On the one hand, we, we, we want to see God glorified and lifted up, but then on the other hand, when, we, when it seems like he's forgotten us, when it seems like he, he, is, he has delayed him, his blessing on us, we get impatient about that. What's, what's up, God? I mean, come on. I deserve this. You know, I, I really want this. Why are you mistreating me this way? And we can have that fleshly response. I think that God's answer to Abram shows us that Abram was tending to look at things more on the fleshly side than on the spiritually focused side. But no doubt he had thoughts and feelings that were kind of from both perspectives. But regardless, we see what he says. He says, Lord God, what wilt thou give me? That was the first words out of his mouth. What are you going to give me? I, I, I want, I need something from you. That was the first thing he said. He couldn't be satisfied. And, and we've been looking at the, the life of Abram these past few chapters. Again, remember, God had already delivered him out of many things. God had led him out of Ur of the Chaldees, and I think he was probably thankful that God didn't leave him there in that pagan place. God had brought him unto Canaan. God had, God had promised him seed. God had promised him the land. He went down into Egypt, and Pharaoh took his wife, not knowing she was his wife. And God brought him, her back to him. I think he was thankful for that. God brought him back to Canaan. God, God used him to deliver Lot out of the, the clutches of the Mesopotamian kings. God had done many things for Abram, and I think Abraham appreciated that, but he wasn't in a place to be satisfied with that. He had all these servants, all these uh, possessions, the land of Canaan promised to him, the military victories, but he wanted more. He wanted more from God, and his dissatisfaction stemmed from he didn't have a child. And that's a temporal thing. It's, it's a big thing. It's an important thing, but it is temporal. It doesn't have, it, it's not about Abram's eternal destination. It's his temporal thing. And it's so easy for us to be dissatisfied related to temporal things, isn't it? We've been talking just briefly. We, we sang the song, I will praise him. Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing. And no matter what happens to us in this life, we have eternity that if you're saved, you, it's settled. Nothing you do here will take away your eternal home. We'll, we'll put that in jeopardy. And what a blessing that is. I was, I was meditating on that again just the other day and how it's so easy to take that for granted and to get used to that. But these people that I talk to, and, and no doubt you have too, they feel like this life is an audition to, to get to heaven. And what pressure there is on, on performance, because I've got to do enough good works, and if I mess up, my whole eternity is in jeopardy. 
that puts a lot of pressure and that, that makes it very difficult to, to be joyful in this life. But what a blessing it is for eternal security, the truth of eternal security, that once you're saved, that eternal home is settled and it, it, it's stable. It can't be taken away from you. But so often, temporal things, the lack of temporal things can take our joy can make us dissatisfied. It's so common for us. And Abram says to the Lord in verse 3, Behold, to me thou hast given no seed. The word behold means see, look. God, look at me. <laughs> I, I want you to, t- to examine this. Behold, to me thou hast given no seed. You're the one that can fix this, and I'd like you to look at this void that I have. And he says it again. And lo, one born in my house is my heir. Lo means the same thing. Look, look at this, see it. God, please look at my situation. My problem is visible. It's in front of my face all the time. And it's not good. He was dissatisfied. And I tend to think that Abram was feeling futile at this, at this point. What's the point? You know, it's great that I had military victories and all these herds and cattle and uh, I've got this stable place in Canaan to live. But what's the point? I don't have a child. And when I die, it's all going to be over. There's no future. My steward is going to take over everything that I own. After all he had done and all the success he had enjoyed, he was still at square one. He had left Ur the Chaldees, not merely for wealth or lands or victories, but because God had promised a great future for him, and that involved children. He still lacked seed, as the Bible says. He was feeling futile. What makes you feel futile? No doubt you can grapple with that. You fail in different areas, temporal things, spiritual things, and you feel like, what's the point? Am I, should I just quit this? Am I just spinning my wheels? Did I, did I do anything? Did, did this week matter? What makes you feel futile? Do you take that complaint to God? That's what Abram did. And that's what we ought to do. And Abram was helped. And when we take our complaint to God, we will be helped too. Let's look at God's answer. Abram voiced his complaint, and in verse 4, God answered. It says, and behold, interesting. In verse 3, Abram says, behold and lo. And in verse 4, it says, Behold, yes, Abram, I'm looking. Now you look. Now you turn your eyes to me. You pay attention. Here, this is my answer. Here it comes. Behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, This shall not be thine heir, but he that shall come forth out of thine own bowels shall be thine heir. First of all, God spoke truth. He just says, this shall not be thine heir. I'm giving you an answer. This is a, an imperative statement. This is, this is just a pure statement of fact. Don't think this. Don't worry about, about Eliezer and whether or not he'll have command over all your possessions. Don't worry about the, the child born in your house being in your, your heir. It shall not be thine heir. But he that shall come forth out of thine own bowels shall be thine heir. First of all, God denied Abram's prediction. Your life will not be futile. And when we engage in worry, we indulge in worry and fretting, what we end up doing is we live in the future. We don't like the present, and so our mind goes out into the future, and we start to create and craft this future And it's usually a dystopian future, a doomsday scenario, a prediction of everything going bad and it'll all be terrible. And we have no ability to do that accurately. We have no knowledge of the future. All we can do is make predictions. And we're, I don't know what the number is, but it has to be 99% of the time we're wrong. We create this terrible outcome And we're wrong. And so we ought not live in the future. We ought to trust the Lord with the future and live in the present. But God dispels Abram's doomsday prediction. Fear always creates those in our mind, but truth refutes them. I'm reminded of Elijah, who who did this as well. 1 Kings 19.14, it says, I've been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts because the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thine altars, and slain thy prophets with the sword, and I, even I only, am left. And they seek my life to take it away. What's the point? 
And he said, this was in the, in the cave. Earlier, he said under the juniper tree, it's, it's enough, just let me die. He was ready to give up. He complained. And what did God say to him? 1 Kings 19, 18. God said, yet I have left me 7,000 in Israel, all the knees which have not bowed unto Baal, and every mouth with, which hath not kissed him. It's not as bad as you think. You, you are dissatisfied, you feel like it's futile, and you're going out into the future and saying it's all going to end and be destroyed. But let me tell you, it's not that way. God encouraged him. God denied Abram's prediction and spoke truth. And then God said to Abram, he, he restated God's promise to Abram. He says, this shall not be thine heir, but but he that shall come forth out of thine own bowels shall be thine heir. It's still exactly like I told you it would be. Nothing's changed. And I, it's a blessing to me because God is restating his promise, but he's actually adding information to it. Because earlier he says, I will give you seed and I will, I will make of you a great nation. But now he says to Abram, he that shall come forth out of thine own bowels. He hadn't told that to Abram before. But now he says, he, you're going to have a son. And maybe Abram would have assumed this. But he, pro, he, he, he adds detail. He that shall come forth. I'm still going to keep my promise and let me, let me give you a little bit more vision on what it's, a little more detail on what it's going to be like, what it's going to look like. He spoke truth. And then he directed Abram's gaze. Look at verse 5. God tells him, this is what you need to believe, but let me, let me show you what to look at. And he brought him forth abroad and said, look now toward heaven and tell the stars, if thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, so shall thy seed be. And I, I imagine that in between the phrase to number them, there's a colon and then in the word and, I imagine that there was, there was some time. I don't know if it happened this way, but it, it would seem very, very logical. Look now toward heaven and tell the stars if thou be able to number them. I'll wait. And Abram probably didn't try very long. He, he'd seen the stars before, but... And we have light pollution these days, of course. It's hard to see the stars, especially in town. But you go out, out of town, and there's still so much light pollution, it's called. Things that can obscure our view of the night sky. But there are places in the United States where um, they can, you can go and you could probably look for it online. And they, they say this is you know, the place in the, in the entire 48 states where there's no light pollution. And I've heard of there are, there are uh, national parks like that where you're not allowed to have anything any, any uh, electrical light, any artificial light, because that's why people go there, to look at the stars. And when there is no light pollution, when there are no clouds, it is incredible how many stars. It's, it's like a carpet of stars. It's, it's, the light, it's, it's, it's just, it almost looks like it's weaved, not just a few points like we can see often. And so Abram's looking at this. They didn't have street lights back then. Abram's looking up at these stars where do you even start? And especially with a telescope, now we can do this. And it just multiplies the number of stars that you can see. And Abram sa God says to Abram, look now. I want you to look. You've called on me to look. Behold, lo, I want you to look. Look now toward heaven and tell the stars. If thou be able to number them, you can see them, but you can't count them. That's what I've done. So shall thy seed be. Look up. Is it any coincidence that when God directed Abram's gaze, he directed Abram's gaze upward? It's good for us to look up. Look up. When you're struggling to trust in what God will do, look at what God has already done. If you're saved, he's already done that. And it's settled forever. Look up. And God is saying to Abram, you cannot even number the stars that I have created. You can't even count them, much less duplicate it. Don't worry about my ability. 
to give you a child. You see what I've done? You can't even count this. Don't worry about my ability to give you a, a child. I think about the song Rejoice in the Lord by Ron Hamilton, and I like, I like these lines. I could not see through the shadows ahead, so I looked at the cross of my Savior instead. I don't know what the future holds, but I know what God's already done. So I'm going to look at that, and that will give me the encouragement that I need. When you're doubting God's ability to work in sinners' hearts, remember how he saved you. When you're doubting God's love for you, remember that he sent his only begotten son for you. When you're doubting God's ability to take care of your physical needs, remember that he created the universe. Look at Psalm 50. The fear of futility looks, causes us to look down and look around us. And God wants us to look up. Look at what he's done. He's still speaking truth. He's still directing our gaze. Psalm 50, verse 9. God says, I will take no bullock out of thy house, nor he goats out of thy folds. For every beast of the forest is mine, and the cattle upon a thousand hills. I know all the fowls of the mountains, and the wild beasts of the field are mine. If I were hungry, I would not tell thee, for the world is mine, and the fullness thereof. And Israel was, was used to offering God sacrifices. And if they had the wrong perspective, maybe it would have looked, seemed like, felt like, well, we've got we've to support God here. We've got to keep him fed. We've got to keep him sustained. And God is saying, no, I don't need what you can offer me. I don't need a goat out of your herd or a, or a, a, a bull out of your field. I've got, I've got the, the cattle upon a thousand hills. I have the whole world if I, if I needed something to eat. If I were hungry, I would not tell thee, for the world is mine and the fullness thereof. God is, is not unable to take care of our physical needs. He created the universe with his words. When you're doubting God's ability to give you spiritual victory, remember that Christ has won all victory already. Hebrews 12, 1 and 2, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross despising the shame and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. He has finished the race. He has won the race and we can just follow after him. Matthew 4.11 tells us after the devil did his best to tempt Christ and make, cause him to sin, Matthew 4.11 says, then the devil leaveth him and behold angels came and ministered unto him. Christ took the very worst that the devil had to throw at him and came out on top. 1 Timothy 1.15 says, This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Christ has won the victory. If he can save someone like the Apostle Paul, he can save you and me. He can save, save our loved ones. Look at 1 Corinthians 15. God can give the victory. And if you're struggling in your own life with get, getting spiritual victory, Christ has already won all victory. So just go to him so he can give it to you. Well, I don't know if I'll ever get over this. If I'll ever get past this. God is able. Go to him. Christ has won the victory already. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 55. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. It's not futile, and the victory is accessible. It is at hand through Christ. He giveth us the victory through Christ. It's not in vain. It's not pointless. It's not futile. Look to God. Look to his word. Look to his works. 
That is God's answer to us in our complaint. Because our complaint undermines all those things. Our complaint doubts and, and, and casts doubt on all those things. God points us to the truth. Let me tell you what is true. Let me direct your eyes to what I've done. What was Abram's response? Let's go back to Genesis 15 and we'll see how Abram responded. Abram got what he needed from the Lord and how did he respond? He had a good response. Genesis 15, 6, it says, And he believed in the Lord and he counted it to him for righteousness. If you take your, your complaint to God with an honest desire for help, you will get it. If you don't really want help and you just want to, to accuse and justify yourself, you won't have help. But if you really want help and you take it to the Lord, you will get it. And Abram did. Verse 6, he believed in the Lord. He didn't believe in the stars. He wasn't an astrologer like we read about in Romans 1 where they worship the creature more than the creator, Abram wasn't trusting in the stars. He didn't believe his eyes. He wasn't believing in what he saw. Well, look at those stars. My eyes tell me this is right. He didn't believe in the stars or believe his eyes because there would be cloudy nights where he couldn't see the stars. And cloudy nights can rob us of our peace if we're trusting in what we see. There are times where we can't see. Again, that song, I could not see through the shadows ahead. We don't trust our eyes. Our faith doesn't come from staying in touch, quote unquote, with the proof of God's trustworthiness. Well, as long as I can see those stars, I know that God will come through for me. Uh-oh, I can't see the stars anymore. God must have broken his promise. No, that's not what he was trusting. He didn't craft and believe a new prediction of the future. Oh, well, you know, I didn't see what God's going to do, but now that I think about it, I think God's going to do it this way, and yeah, that has to be it. I'm, I'm excited again because I've thought of a way for how, for how God can keep his promise. Now I can believe it. He didn't, he didn't trust in that. It says he believed in the Lord. Not in the stars, not in his eyes, not in his imagination or predictions. He believed in the Lord. And this attitude says... I don't know how you're going to do it. I don't know when you're going to do it. But I know that you will perform the good promises you have given. I will trust in you, and therefore I will have what I need and desire. This made Abram righteous in God's eyes. He, God, counted it to him, Abram, for righteousness, because he believed in the Lord. And how easy it is. It's a heart choice, and any of us can do that. Any of us can have this righteousness that the Lord counts to us. Romans chapter 4, I'll, I'll read it for you, the first five verses of the chapter, talking about Abram. What shall, we then, what shall we say then that Abram our father, as pertaining to the flesh, hath found? For if Abram were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that, is, that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. We don't trust in our works. In Galatians 3, 7 through 11, talk about this as well. We don't trust in what we can do and what we do in the flesh. We trust in what God has said. We believe in the Lord and it's counted to us for righteousness. Our faith in God will produce works, but we don't trust in our works. We trust in God. I want us to go back to Genesis 15. Maybe you're still there. And notice God's provision, though. We've seen his answer. We know what God promised. And, and if you know the life of Abram, you know what, what happened later. But, but look at God's provision in verse 1. I think it's fascinating to read this. Genesis 15, 1, After these things the word of the Lord came unto Abram in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. He said this before Abram brought his complaint to God. He said, Fear not, but Abram was afraid. 
he said, Fear not, Abram, I am thy shield. Abram was looking at temporal needs while he was in conversation with the I am. What a, a normal human perspective, but it's not right. We get caught up in temporal things while we are praying to the I am. Why are we worried about temporal things? God said, I am thy shield. Fear is absurd with God as our shield. Psalm 23, 4 says, I will fear no evil for thou art with me. If God can shield you, there's nothing to worry about. The, the military has, has armor and then armor-piercing ammunition, armor-piercing rounds, and, and you need a bigger shield, and then they get better bullets, and then you need a bigger shield, and with God as your shield, there's nothing to fear. I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. What more could we need? But God does more. Thy exceeding great reward. He says, I am your reward. Not what I'm going to give you. I am your reward. I'm all yours, Abram. There's great blessing in store for you in me. That's essentially what he's saying. God's provision is just as specific and personal to us as our selfish desires are to us. You have desires in your heart that are a little bit different from my desires and a little bit different from this person and that person. We all have our customized personal set of desires. They're similar, but there's, some, there's something particular that's unique and personal to us, and God's provision for us is just as unique and personal. Before Abram complained, God had given him the answer. And isn't that true for us? How often has that happened to you and me? We, we run into a wall and we start crying and pray, crying out to God. We're frustrated, we're angry, all these things. And then we realize, oh yeah, God, just, God was just giving me the answer last week, yesterday, the other day. I already had the answer and here I'm struggling as though God didn't give it to me. God gave him the answer and Abram apparently wasn't listening or paying attention because then he opened up his complaint when God had just given him what he needed to hear. Before Abram had voiced his distressed predictions, God had given him the comfort that he needed. Before Abram had asked God for the thing he desired, God had given him the one he needed most of all. And God is still doing this for us. He knows our need before we do. Matthew 6, 7, and 8, But when ye pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. Be not ye therefore like unto them, for your Father knoweth what things ye have need of before ye ask him. Praise God that he is already watching, already caring, already presenting himself as the provision for our every need. There is no chance of futility when God is our shield and exceeding great reward. Is that true of you? Without him, yeah, your life will be futile. But with him, it's impossible for it to be futile because God is doing it. What more could we possibly want if we have God? And the flesh says, well, I've got a whole list and God's not enough. Let me tell you what I want. But that's not the right approach. What could we possibly want if we have God? May God help us to be satisfied in him, satisfied with him, and satisfied with his promised work in our lives and others. David says it well in Psalm 23, 1. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. I won't lack. I, I have everything I need because he is my shepherd. We don't need to fear futility when we have God. Romans 8, 28 to 31. You can turn over there and we'll, we'll read and finish. Romans 8, 28, a very familiar passage of Scripture, but always a blessing when we read it thoughtfully. There is no futility with God. He'll always keep His promises. He'll always take care of us. Romans 8, 28 says, And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed 
to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called, and whom he called, them he also justified, and whom he justified, them he also glorified. What shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? That's the answer to our fear of futility. If God can be for us, who can be against us? Nobody can oppose and destroy and cast down what God is doing. So let's be, let's be on God's side so that he is for us because nobody can be against us. But it's not always easy. It's not always enjoyable as Abram discovered and as we discover. But it's because we are being conformed to the image of the Son of God so that we can be like him. He can be the firstborn among many brethren. What a blessing it is to think about that, to be conformed to the image of Christ so that we can all be siblings in that sense. You know how family resemblance makes children look alike and look similar, and some families especially, there's no, there's no mistaking, might be complete strangers to you. You've never met them before in your life, but you can pick them out in, in a crowded room. Oh yeah, I see the family resemblance. That's what God's doing in saints. We can look like Christ spiritually. That's what he's working on. That's not futile. That's exciting. So we don't need to fear futility. Abram was reassured. God spoke the truth and then directed his eyes. Look at what I've done. Be encouraged. And Abram believed in the Lord, and so should we. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this reminder of what we ought to look at. It's so easy for us to look at temporal things. That's all we know. This life on earth is all we've ever ex experienced. We've never lived in heaven. We've never lived in an eternal state. We've always been bound and limited and, and sort of captive to this temporal life and this fleshly, earthly body. And so we are we're limited in our perspective, but you continually direct us to the truth, what you have said, and for us to, to turn our eyes and, and consider and meditate on what you have done. And if we'll do that with a sincere heart, truly wanting help, we'll always find it in you. Thank you for what you did for Abram. Help us to learn from that example. Help us to be content with you as our shield and reward and not be disturbed and discontented, dissatisfied because we are lacking something temporal that we've decided we want. Help us just to rest in you and to be a good testimony to others so that they can do the same. Thank you for your great plan for us. It's not futile. It's not in vain. The point is still clear and joyful and wonderful. Help us to live each day with that in mind. I pray that you would do this work in our hearts each and every day. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you for your attention. Let's be encouraged by these things. Encourage others as we go about our week. And uh, we'll be, we'll, let's expect God to work in the next hour as well. You're dismissed for a few minutes and then we'll begin the 11 o'clock service at that time. Thank you.